Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Aliens and UFOs video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another new entry here. This one yet again based on one of your new suggestions. This one more than the lines of a topic rather than an actual entry itself. One of you has suggested with regards to talking about more men in black encounters. And so I was looking some information on that. It's a pretty popular subject based on some of my past videos on the men in black. And in this case, I wanted to highlight one of the earliest known sightings, one of the earliest known encounters that someone has with the men in black. Pretty frightful experience, pretty unique one too. This was as pretty much straight out of the world of the twilight zone. And definitely one that I wanted to share here. Uh, but you're looking at a representation of it now. It goes by several unique names, but in this case, I'll talk about it as this. The Strange Encounter of the Men in Black with Dr. Herbert Hopkins. So let's go ahead and let's share this info here. And I'd love to hear what your comments are with regards to this very first entry of a Men in Black encounter. So here's what happens. They have to go back to September of 1976. There in Maine, there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Herbert Hopkins. He was someone that was apparently working on a case involving something called the Stevens case, which was part of a UFO investigation, more along the lines of him doing some type of therapy slash hypnotherapy to get more info for it. And that involved actually working on tapes uh, with regards to those sessions. I want to provide more detail on that. I'm sure there's more out there for it. But in this case, we're just going to focus on the Men in Black encounter itself. So on that fateful evening, that's when all of a sudden Dr. Herbert Hopkins, who was there at home by himself, his family had just left a little bit earlier, he received a phone call from a man who stated that he belonged to a UFO investigative group, one of the regional ones, in fact. He stated that he, too, was interested in the Stevens case and wanted to ask if he could come over and then discuss more of this with Dr. Herbert Hopkins. So Dr. Herbert Hopkins said, yeah, sure, you know, come on over. But what he didn't expect was this. All of a sudden, there was a man right there coming up to his home as soon as he hung up the phone. Remember, this is 1976. There were no cell phones at the time. There weren't even hardly around any pay phones around, at least according to his area that Dr. Hopkins was stating. Um, the only indication that someone would be there right there at his location, at his home, would be by travel, like in this case in the form of a car or some other type of vehicle, but there was no vehicle up front. So how could that happen? How could somebody be talking to him? about coming over to his house, and then seconds later after hanging up, that's when he saw a figure coming directly up to his house. But it was a very, very unique figure. In fact, let's talk about that here. The reason why this is considered one of the first cases, if not the first, of Men in Black Encounters is because it pretty much started the telltale signs, the classic signs associated with a man in black. So, in other words, this was a guy, the way he looked like was your standard man, but he appeared to be in a dark or black navy suit. On top of that, he had dark or black gray gloves, and he was wearing a hat, once again, a dark or black, and then it was a bowler style hat. And the way he described it was he was there just heading up the walkway straight up to his house. So interestingly enough, Dr. Hopkins wasn't alarmed. In fact, he described the situation as pretty unique because normally he wouldn't just have strangers come up to his house and then let alone him invite the stranger up to in inside the house. But he did so. And so he actually invited the stranger inside his house. The stranger identified himself as the one that had just been talking to him about talking about the Stevens case. And so they went inside. And so lo and behold, Dr. Hopkins, again, much to his surprise, was recounting details of the case. And every now and then as they were sitting within an area there, I guess it was the living room itself, that's when this quote-unquote visitor would listen intently but say strange things, like something along the lines of, Yes, that's how I understand it. Anytime there was something discussed between the case and whatever Dr. Hopkins was stating. It made it sound like, again, like he knew the information. 
He was just already confirming it with whatever what uh, you know Dr. Hopkins was stating himself. And then another interesting thing happened. At one point, that's when this man in black decided to brush his mouth with the back of one of his gloves. But interestingly enough, there was this lipstick, almost like this red mark, that appeared on the back of the glove. And so when Dr. Hopkins saw that, he knew that it came from the guy's mouth. <clears throat> and that's when he realized that, lo and behold, there was this lipstick, if you could even call it that, on the actual lips of this man in black. And then that's when he realized the guy didn't even have any lips. And in fact, the lipstick itself was purposely there to make certain that it looked like the guy had some kind of lips, but instead the mouth itself was just one really, really thin slit. But the makeup effect associated with the lipstick helped a little bit. Obviously, this was not something that stood out at the beginning, but now that attention was drawn to the mouth area, then that's when things obviously took another turn. But another interesting twist is that despite the unusual characteristics of the man, the way he walked, the way he talked as well, his eyes, though, appeared normal. There was nothing unusual with regards to that. But another situation happened, and this again took things to a whole other level. This was where things almost took a form of a threat, if you could even call it that. At one point, this man in black told Dr. Hopkins that he knew that he had two coins within his pocket. And Dr. Hopkins was surprised at that fact because he did. In fact, he had two coins there because he had just happened to pay a local newsboy for a copy of a paper. And so when that happened, he had two coins right there within his pocket. He told him to bring out one of those coins, which happened to be a brand new shiny penny. And then he told him to hold the coins in his hand. And so when that happened, the guy was holding the coin in his hand. And then he realized all of a sudden that the coin started to take on a quote unquote fuzzy appearance. And then within a few seconds, it vanished right out of thin air, right there in front of both of them. Obviously, this startled Dr. Hopkins because, you know, who, who imagines seeing something vanish right there in front of you? And what the guy said next obviously confirmed that he said, neither you nor anyone else on this plane will ever see that coin again. What a strange cryptic remark, right? When it comes to saying something along those lines, why would someone say that? Why would they make something disappear and then state that on this plane, which made it seem like it was more on the lines of on this dimension, will they ever see that coin again? And so next thing, though, almost like again in the form of a threat, that's when the guy in black started asking him, started asking Dr. Hopkins if he knew who Barney Hill was. And he happened to state that, yes, he knew who he was. He knew uh, his wife, Betty, as well. They were the ones taken on that infamous UFO abduction from a little bit earlier, back in 1961. And then he said that he believed that Barney Hill had actually just died of a heart attack. And then what had happened, though, was another cryptic response from this man in black. He said, Barney Hill did die because he did not have a heart, just as you no longer have a coin. Doesn't it sound like a very cryptic threat, right? The idea that here you have something where the guy's coin disappeared and then he's stating, almost alluding, that Barney Hill's heart also disappeared just like that. Like they had the power to essentially do that at any moment whatsoever. And he continued with this threat by asking him about those tape recordings again on the Stevens case. And now he told him, rather than asking, he told them, he stated that he should make those disappear. Like in other words, destroy those documents. And then that way, he'll make sure that nothing else bad happens. In fact, it was any documents, any tapes associated with the case itself. Again, this didn't seem to Dr. Hopkins like it was a violent threat. He didn't have like any indication of, of getting telling this guy, you know, get out at that point or even uh, lashing out to the guy because of what he was saying. In fact, the way he described it was it was not the least bit indignant and not the least bit angry. He just simply said to do it like it was almost a direct order rather than anything else involving a straight, angry, violent manner. And so he grew concerned about this. And then that's when the guy indicated that if this was not that it was more the lines like he would know 
that this would not be done. In fact, he said this exactly. He said he would know when I had done that, actually gotten rid of the tapes. Again, alluding that he was aware whether or not the, this Dr. Hopkins would do it in the future. And if he did, then he would know at that very moment too. Who would do that, right? Too? Who would have that almost omnipresence when it comes to being able to know exactly when that was? And so he was alluding everything that I got from this discussion was the coin disappearing, the threat of what happened to Barney Hill, and now with this involving the tapes, clearly 2 plus 2 equals what when it comes to the results if Dr. Hopkins didn't have something along those lines done as far as destroying the tapes. And so that was it. Once that veil threat was done, then that's when the demeanor associated with this man in black took yet another interesting turn. Dr. Hopkins said that the guy's speech began to slow down. The spaces between his words were actually coming up slow and erratic. And he said another cryptic, interesting response. He said, my energy is running low. I must go now. Goodbye. And then that was it. That's when this man in black got up. He decided to go out of the house. This time, though, he was actually clinging on to several things like the railing and the wall itself as he was moving one foot at a time slowly down. It looked like, yeah, something was happening to him and he was not able to um, go with at least the same speed that he was operating before. But instead of going in the direction where he came from at the very beginning where Dr. Hopkins first saw him walk up to the house, he decided to take a left. He decided to go to the area around the corner of the house. And so Dr. Hopkins just watched him do this slowly but surely get to the corner. He finally saw him one last time holding on to the wall just before he slowly went off into the back area behind the corner. And then that was it. He had disappeared. There was no indication that there was a car that had left. There was no indication that there was any other vehicle as well. He had just straight up disappeared as the way Dr. Hoppin stated, and then he disappeared around the corner. And so he went to inspect that area. There was no cars. There was nothing there. They did see like what he described as a bright bluish white light almost go someplace else. It was kind of hard for me to discern how this read. Like, did he see it go up into the sky? Did he see it go around the corner to another street area? I'm not sure. The only thing that stood out around that corner was there was these tracks. He said it almost looked like it came from a tractor. And so that was the only hint that something was unusual around that spot. But nothing there to indicate where this man in black went, uh, just disappearing out of the blue. No indication what took him elsewhere. He was just gone, gone from the face of the earth right then and there. The only other thing that stood out uh, to Dr. Hopkins was... During this encounter, his dog, which was a Collie German Shepherd mix, was going crazy, was going a little bananas within the household the moment that this man in black was in there. In fact, he retreated to another room and hid straight up in the closet because he didn't want to be around this man in black. But then that was it. That was the essentially the first known encounter of a man in black, or at least one of the earliest ones, and it happened too. This guy, Dr. Herbert Hopkins, right there in the middle of his home shortly after beginning and trying to do an investigation into the Stevens case. Interesting stuff, yeah? This is the kind of stuff that, that, that again, just makes you wonder and scratch your head how this happens, who this person was, what they were doing there, where they went off to afterward. No indication. Um, there was apparently some other instances that Dr. Hopkins had with other men in black. And so I may talk about those in the future, but at least in this case, I wanted to highlight the first one. But if anybody has any more info, anything else I might have missed, please post those comments below. Those of you more familiar with this incident, if you have any more comments as well, then I'd love to hear what those are too. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care. Bye.